I know, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, well, thanks for coming, Flavian. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, Flavian is an old colleague of mine, which means we get to do it in person. Seven years. Okay. Yeah, I, okay, I'm not... Uh, <laughs> Let's not go there. Let's not go there because we're about the same age, exactly. Actually, so we can we can Solid say number, right? We're both very young people, mm -hmm. very young scientific researchers at Pridio. Exactly. Uh, and well, Flavian has a very uh, fancy role as a scientific advisor for performance at Pridio Labs. Deep performance. Yeah. Deep performance. Deep so you, you've been on many projects over the seven years we've been working together. Sure. Um, and so you have been doing. You're very also very well known in the Rexus community uh, over a long period of time. Public publishing and so forth. So welcome, and uh, this is a great opportunity for us to dig into what sure. you know about. Happy so to, to be here, and uh, yeah, let's get started. Um, happy to to discuss anything that that comes to mind. Anything which is very mind. risky with you, but. <laughs> Uh, so it. yeah, so we also we argue a lot. Uh, <laughs> so we'll try not to now. I we actually we have a colleague that I I, I said to him like this it's really great if you have like two smart people uh, talking you can really learn a lot. And he was like rolling his eyes if only. So anyway, we'll try to be and we'll try to keep on the point. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, okay, maybe it's a good to just just start off introducing yourself and what like. What you got you interested in machine learning? Why you didn't end up pursuing fashion photography and uh... Uh, none of the things? Yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, not maybe do fancy shirts. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I guess I like the AI since uh, since a little kid. Like uh, I think it's mostly just reading, I guess, a lot of sci-fi books and uh, playing video games. Uh, I just wanted to, I guess, code video games, and that's how I got into programming. And then um, this is yeah. you growing up in Romania, yeah. programming quite young. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Well, yeah, what I were you know. programming in? Uh, just uh, basic to begin with, and then uh, Turbo Pascal, and then uh, C. I guess that would be like the progression I think that. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, first there was like Spectrum computers and stuff like tape, tape drives. Exactly. Yeah. yeah very. Well, you go away while it's loading. Loading exactly, it's, and then you put like you would need this to. This whole thing when we tried it, we did we, we did were young. This yeah. we've totally blown it now. Exactly. People going what tape drive? What's this? Exactly. Anyway. So all that, yeah. So um, so yeah, sci fi and video games, I guess, uh, and then um, yeah, I did basically programming, and then I guess I discovered AI during my undergrad. Uh, I did um, a double major in cybernetics and um, in economics. Actually, and uh, well, everyone's done a major in cybernetics, also. Yeah, that, 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 <laughs> I, I think it's, I don't know, I think only Russians and Romanians have such a major. It, it might still exist, actually. It's a, it's a specialization that you could specialize in statistics, this, and uh, macroeconomics. And I chose cybernetics, which was kind of the, the, the more like programming version of uh, the Academy of uh, Economics and Sciences. We talk, uh, you could yeah. you could be a programmer in Romania either by the, doing in mass, and then you'd be like pure computer science. Then either you do electrical engineering, and it'll be more closer to hardware, the polytechnics, and then it could be more like towards modeling and stuff, which would be like in the where I went basically in cybernetics uh, group. What, and, what, uh, what is, how, do you, how do you define cybernetics? Uh, do you define it? I mean, now it's like I don't know if anybody. Before it was like the theory of systems, and I was really about like control and things like that. And uh, like we used it for economics, so it was like the macro models of the economy, and then the micro models for like the firm and stuff like that. The ins and outs. And there were a bunch of like, it basically it was econometrics. I guess you you could say uh, we did a lot of econometrics so, yeah. under the umbrella of this kind of approach. Because the field was, I think, created by Norbert Wiener. Right. But I mean, what actually in practice we did was really a lot of, I guess, econometrics okay. uh, because it was in the Academy of Economics. I, I want to look up the name of this book, but it, it has something like the control in the animal and the machine or something like right. it's something it's, really crazy. Well, you know, <laughs> like, again, Russia, Romania, it was all about like, you know, central control, right? So central planning. And it was all about like okay. the theory of everything and how do you organize and how do you have feedback loops and everything self-correct and stuff like that. And then basically for economics means again, like, uh, well, this was post revolution. So it was mostly, there was a firm before, I guess there was just macroeconomics. After that, there used to be, the, the microeconomics reappeared and the, there was the idea of like a economic agent and what uh, an economic agent, like how do you maximize profit? It's interesting that uh, we've changed like that. The, the disciplines you study. Right. 
Uh, that was, I guess it impressed me. I guess there was some AI in some sense in, uh, as part of it. And, well, I mean, some genetics is definitely AI, right? at least. Right. I mean, there was no, not, I mean, I had the course last year of undergrad on this and then I uh, became passionate about it. And you have to, like you used to be, I don't even know for sure. Now you used to have actually, even in undergrad, you had to finish with a thesis. So you had to choose a field and graduate with a thesis on that field. So I chose AI and then, uh, my advisor asked me if I want to do a PhD in AI, and uh, I said, oh, later. Like, I want first to go to industry, and she said, like, no, no, like, later life will just uh, go in the way like you do it now. That seemed to be both true and not true. Exactly. And then I was like, do I want to do it here, or do I do want to do it uh, in the best place possible in the U.S.? And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to U.S., and I, I went for a PhD in U.S., and that's kind of how I, I moved to U.S. Where was that? Uh, Iowa State. Okay. So I stayed there for years. And what uh, topic? I changed topics. I mean, I did a bunch of things there. Actually, yeah. I studied because my 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 um, advisor was a lot into bioinformatics, but the, so he did a lot of like distributed learning because you had this kind of private data sets and stuff like that. Things that are coming back, by the way. Uh, and he had a lot of like uh, grants and stuff like that. But I was more interested in tech, so I did a bunch of text. Uh, like an LP, because we like before bio, it was cool. Quite a I, long I think it was. I, I found it cool. I thought it was cool. cool. Yeah. And then, um, but then towards like third year, I got into like high order like metric decomposition. I did a lot of tensor decomposition and stuff like that. So to do, you know, like a uh, lot of different semantic indexing and stuff. And I had like. You were dimensional. really thinking of recommendation at this point. No. I guess maybe there was a delicious data set back then. There was like tags, users send articles and you had to kind of match them. So I guess you could say it was kind of a yeah. And then I did my, I, I had my internship, you know, cause there in order to, you know, you have like a small window to find a company that kind of wants to, to kind of sponsor your, uh, your H1B. You kind of in the last year of your PhD, you need to find a company. So you need to intern and ideally the, the company like sponsors your green card. So I went to Yahoo Labs, which was kind of then back then like the-, the That must have been a real career to get that. Yeah. And uh, I was in the advertising group and I started doing basically uh, embeddings. Like, you know, there was like uh, kind of SVD became popular, like SVD++, there was the Netflix challenge. It was kind of that year. And then uh, I did that for like keywords and it was working quite well and they liked it. And they made me an offer, and then I basically stayed. So, so that's like my first job out of. That probably was the pet place to be at the time. As yeah, well, it was like so they could be all sorts of places now. But the Yahoo led the creative competition advertising. So we had Olivia Chappelle, uh, we had uh, Alex Mola, we had John Langford, we had everybody, basically everybody that was anybody was there at that point. Uh, and then, yeah, I started doing basically behavioral targeting as part of my day to day job. Um, and I did that for two years or so. And then I moved to search. And then I did, again, like a lot of content understanding, information extraction, stuff like that. And I remember, actually, my manager said, you know, like, we could actually work with, uh, with this guy that does this thing called DeepNets. Like, do you have time to, to look to see if we should uh, consult with him? And I was like, I'm busy. I have some other stuff. And um, it was Hinton. Uh, so, uh, so, um, oh, so well, I, I, yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, exactly. would have been um, this close to a Nobel Prize. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and then I was like, no, I don't know. And then, um, and I think I, you know, Yap was not going too well. And I think I was already kind of thinking of like, you know, going away because there were other, you know, Meta was coming on Facebook, but then Twitter was coming, you know, that like the new, Kids on the block, and I was, uh, wanted to be, you know, to to, to have that startup vibe, uh, and uh, so then I moved to, to Twitter. Actually, um, they were pre-IPO; they were like the the darlings back then. And then I stayed around two years, and I did a bunch of uh, again in the revenue group, in the advertising group, and I did a bunch of graph-based uh, targeting because they had like this follow graph, and then how you use it to to kind of you know do do sponsored. Kind so of, similar problems at some level. Yeah, different scale, much much larger scale, different. Yeah, but well, uh, I mean, we probably talked about it. Recommendation bidding isn't that similar. But, right. Yeah. So so that was that was interesting, and then I realized more for let's say personal reasons that I I, I was kind of getting sick of uh, Silicon Valley because it was a bit still too suburban for me. Uh, and Silicon Valley, like uh, San Francisco, is just too too damn cold. So I was like, I I need to to move to a real city either, and my preference were New York or Paris. 
And then I found Criteo, one of my uh, ex-bosses became uh, head of research at Criteo. And then uh, I was like, okay, they have conversion data, which I knew is like, like that was the setting point for me for uh, joining Criteo. Because at Yahoo, I remember we had the data set of 10,000 conversions and we felt like gods, like, all right, we have conversion data. <laughs> Then I heard this French startup that has conversion data galore, like with many, many, many uh, companies. I was like, how did they pull this up? Like, it's going to work no matter what we do, it's going to work. And they had also Olivier Chappell. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm sold. So uh, so I joined. So that was 11 years ago. Okay. So that's that's how I got to Cristel, if and that's so you, what you were saying. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and then you worked a few years in France, in, in, in the US. One year. One, one, year, one year. year. Okay. So because I joined, since the beginning, yeah, when I joined, I said, I'm, I want to move back to, to Europe. I want to, you know, I don't want to be in Silicon Valley anymore. I want to be in a real city. So they were like, okay, sure. Okay. You've been and back in a, a decade then? Yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah, okay. 10 years now. Yeah. So okay. And then this I, fall, actually. I joined three years or four years exactly. ago or something like this. So then, yeah. By then, yeah. So ex I think we met exactly, well, one year after I switched to recommendation because first two years I did a lot of bidding. And then I had Alexi Kono, who's now at OpenAI and doing uh, amazing things. Uh, to do product embeddings. Uh, and that was the internship that like, you know, got me into real, like really deep learning and recommendation. I was like, okay, okay. I'm doing that. To me, you were always a record guy. No, 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 yeah, yeah. I studied as bidding. I, I did weighted by VPO and a bunch of other things. And okay. then I, I moved to record like, I guess eight years ago. Okay, okay, so cool. That's a pretty mm -hmm. thorough introduction. And, um, and I think at Credio, I, I, you know, you've been like very central in, in a lot of shifts in technology. I guess and... I'm vocal. I don't know if I'm essential, but I'm vocal. So I guess that you can say that about me. Um, and it, this is not an easy, like not everyone. I, I think you, I think you're being modest here. Yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, this does require knowledge of business, knowledge of tech, knowledge of the science. Right. How do you put all this together? To, uh, I think it's just the fact that I just been doing advertising all my career by now. So I feel I know advertising quite well. Um, What's special about advertising compared to other, like other well, how did I, know, right? <laughs> I just know advertising. So um, what is this special? It's a good question. I think, I think uh, all survivability, I guess it's like a being able to emit test with, with low consequences, low moral consequences, I would say, yeah. it's important. Uh, like, you wouldn't be able to do that with it, medical Experimentation practice. is easy. And, yeah, and inter like, inter intervention and causality. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's a fast loop, I would say, right? I mean, maybe finance is a bit like that, but even there, I guess, there might be some more regulation and more, like, you know, like what you can do with portfolios and stuff. I, I don't know. Like, uh, I, again, I don't have visibility, but other, you know, like, where else would you be able to try your ideas and fail that fast and find out. And I think maybe that's why deep learning and machine learning is going so fast is because they have advertising as a test that uh, a lot of other things take just longer, right? Designing a plane, finding out if it's a good idea or not. Everything that's in the real world usually takes longer. Yeah, okay, but there's, I, I remember seeing a talk a few years ago, it must be very not true now, but they were saying most cycles for machine learning Half a recommendation. I'm sure this is completely false now. Most cycles, you mean like a training descent? Like... Yeah, exactly. GPU or CPU cycles, most of what, and it was like five years ago, something like this. I saw talks talk saying things like this. Right. Which like probably, it, I can. I think it was true, but I don't is, think it's true now. Which is in some sense advertising, right? I mean, because, I mean, it depends on how you look at it. But right? LLM training is not. Right. It's a good question. Like, what, what sponsors that economic model, if anything, for now? I would say maybe it's still a bit exploratory. Like, I don't think like the valuation is yet, I mean, came through. Like, I mean, I think LMs are still, you know, valued and the GPUs but, are valued. I mean, I, I would put this as a, something that makes advertising special is it's profitable now. Right, it, right. It works now, it's profitable now. Well, and the fact that, that most LMs are, well, I mean, maybe not most, the open ad is not an advertising company, but I mean, Google is, Meta is, and they are, in, Microsoft is. Uh, does Microsoft have its own one? I guess they do, no? I don't know. Which thing uh, uh, No, I'm just wondering if they have their own LLM, actually. Uh, X has one, which I guess it's an advertising company. I would say they, are, yeah, I mean, course, they, they yeah. have a business model. So most, let's say not all LLMs, but most LLMs are, and even the OpenAI one is basically based on architecture discovered with advertising money. So LLMs are brought 
in some sense by advertising money to to the level they are today. Now, what you know pays for them together now, like well, where are the investment coming from? I think it's from future usage, which might not be advertising. It, it might be more than that. Possibly, yeah. Um, yeah. There's some subscription services that make money. Uh, I, it's not the only one, but yeah. Um, I guess OpenAI is making reasonably good money. I'm I'm a I'm a subscriber since day one, so uh, so yeah. Yeah, they're making money, but not not, not profitable. But they're, they're, they're looking. They I, I mean, be, honestly, I wouldn't I take financial could, advice from anybody. I think they could slim down to to become profitable. I think it's just everybody is racist, and this is give the money. So why wouldn't they? You know, no. I mean, like I would do the same. Okay. Um, but uh, but we digress. Right? Yeah, we did a little bit actually because it was like the the, the type of work you've got done at Credio because you've implemented various quite big changes in the stack right. to modernize the the machine learning stack at Critio. Right. Maybe you talk a little bit about what you've done. What what you well, I, I guess of course it's uh, it's uh, it's about the Canon, right? Uh, it's that's the main thing that we we did that that I would say changed the way Critio operates. Um, so and, what is it? Because I know that right, right. Yeah. So I guess just kind of to to go back to where we talk started. Like as I was saying, we did product embeddings um, work, the internship, like kind of exploratory work with uh, Alex Kono, and then the question was how to put this in production. And we realized that it's very hard to to try things that are very far away from what we do normally in production, and that was. Like kind of a, a moment of reflection, and I like to think that together with other things was kind of the, you know, like the the, the factor that made the Krita lab uh, exist. Like uh, what six years ago, um, there was already kind of a discussion of like deep learning for advertising and things like that. And JB uh, Rudolf, who was the CEO at the time, decided to invest in in this with the explicit goal of unlocking uh, performance for upper funnel, right? So. We had a very good engine for retargeting, but we didn't know how to do recommendations for upper funnels so or for uh, for users that come for the first time for on a advertiser website or see ads from a from a new advertiser that they never interacted with. Like when you compare these two modes on this kind of call star problem, like you know our current or our previous versions of recommendation, which was very much like collaborative filtering, this were were not working too well, right? So the 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 pitch it, was let's let's do something there. It might be worth explaining what some of these things are. Retargeting upper funnel, right? Okay. Uh, so yeah, maybe the crowd is not as advertising. Uh, so so yeah, like the bread and butter of keto, it's of course um, retargeting. That's that's how we got started. That's how uh, for the longest we were known in the industry. Uh, since we're a B two B company, um, we have a really good solution for uh, reengaging users that were previously on an e-commerce website. So if you go to Laredut, let's say, uh, we will buy display opportunities on the web to prime you to come back to, to, to Laredut using products either from your own history like with Laredut or similar. And that's the added value of recommendation, that similarity, right? Finding new products that are similar from the historical products and kind of enriching this, the set of things that we could show. And that turns out to be a really good idea because when we started doing this, which was kind of, again, kind of the, the core technology of crypto, we started seeing results that were never seen before in display advertising. Same CTR rates, same, like in the same order magnitude with search, sponsor search, right? Sponsor search was kind of the, the top row as kind of type of uh, campaign before. And then display advertising was kind of more of a CPM basis. Like, you know, you show a bunch of ads and, you know, pray they work. And then suddenly here comes crypto, with this kind of new way of creating ads, like dynamic ads that are personalized based on your own history, and they their CTR is amazing, right? So this sold amazingly well, and this became like the core um, the core business model for crypto. But then, once you want to to take this, and the, your clients say, "Now I want user acquisition. Like this is great. We can re-engage our current users, but uh, we want new users, and you want to create a product for that, and you use the same technology. It doesn't work." That's that's pretty much what was happening in 2017, let's say. So then the idea was, why don't we use product embeddings to compute similarities uh, for these users, uh, basically using products from the new from the new retailer, 
sim that are similar to products that this user saw on a different retailer. So solving the cost problem. Okay. That was the pitch. Maybe just a few details to add. So at this stage, it was all logistic regression, which right. was actually a brilliant solution in many ways. It right. was, and it was doing both the bidding and, and the click prediction. Right, but the sources was, were really basically co-currencies, right? So you would have like this, so this again, product. Again, <laughs> right. what, so there is, I, I would call this a two-stage two system. Right. We and have a logistic regression detecting whether the recommendation is good or not. So the banner right. feedback, et cetera, and candidate generation, right. which is what you're, what you're referring to as sources. I actually don't know how widespread that term is. It's within Credio anyway. I, well, it's sources for sure, but yeah, it's like candidate sources. So yeah, but the, the, the two-step process, I think it's like the most classical way to do recommendation. Everybody does it because it allows you to scale. You kind of pre-compute in some sense candidates and then real time you re-rank them and you create either the top one or the top K kind of you know set that you're gonna show in a in an experience, let's say in a slate like Netflix will show you kind of rows of recommendations with different meanings. Amazon will do you know various panels, we will show you a van with again, let's say it's three or four, six or seven items. Um, so then yeah, going back to this, so to put this in context, our baseline was a source of candidates that was just really co-occurrence based, right? So you would find out what are the products that co-occur the most with your historical products. But when you do that across websites, of course, this matches to become very large and very sparse. So this will not work anymore. Like the signal will get lost. And then if you just try to find the top, the top would be very noisy. Like it wouldn't be relevant. The ads wouldn't click. So very simple challenge, right? So then the whole idea was that now, if you factorize these metrics, you take you keep the signal, you take you throw away the, the noise, and you keep the the you know the good part. And that's exactly what we did, right? And then you can do this in a batch mode or you can do this in a streaming mode, and one basically becomes like a word to vec like algorithm. That's kind of what we did during the internship. And then what we actually shipped was this kind of batch batch kind of uh, solution where we did like randomized large scale SVD where we computed all the product embeddings in a country uh, in a single step. And that actually worked until this year when we reverted now to a yet again, a streaming kind of more like deep learning friendly method, which we call now organic embeddings, which get again closer to a word to vec. So we saw this kind of pendulum sweep. So we started with word to vec like algorithm, then we did a batch one, and then we came back now to, to streaming. And yeah, it's PyTorch, it's everything, it's, you know, Deep learning friendly, so but yeah. And can you there explain are what is DKNN? Okay, so DKNN it's this idea of creating basically product embeddings and user embeddings, because right, you want to compute the similarity and find out what are the products that are the most similar to the user history. So that's the deep part, and then the search part, like how to find this uh, this uh, this uh, items very quickly, is the K nearest neighbor part, right? It's the trick of, in order to find out the thing that maximizes in a product. You don't need to do an exhaustive search. You can actually create a, an index in which you can look for things in algorithmic time, right? And there are multiple methods to do that. Hierarchical, small navigable worlds, HSNW, then there is the IPQV or whatever is called the quantilist method. Uh, and they're all wrapped now in nice libraries like face. And then you can choose, like you can choose and see what works for you. But the whole point is that you can do that in logarithmic time. And that was again, like the combination of these two things, creating embeddings offline, and then indexing them and serving them very fast online was kind of, and so the deep plus KNN was kind of the, the winning solution. Yeah. I, I like to think that we did kind of among the first ones, uh, we had that running basically in 2018, towards the end of the year. My memory was we were trying deep without the KNN at some point and it was difficult, let's say. Well, I mean, we knew that we we're gonna have issues in like how to scale it up. So yeah. we, yeah, the moment we basically, discovered canon like we put these two things together and we're like okay this is uh did you do you remember what was the moment that was like these two things are going to really work when did you it was sometimes like i think in 2018 uh i i realized that we could we could do a general general purpose similar, similarity search engine with this and be like which we call now vector dbs or rag or whatever people call it for evidence um I realized that 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 is a pattern that we have everywhere, right? It's like this context maximizing uh, action, right? You always find you have a context and you're trying to find the action that maximize some 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 utility, right? And that is bidding, well, not bidding per se, but 
like campaign selection, that's also recommendation, that's also sponsor search. Mm -hmm. So then, then I realized that that would be a very useful engine to have. It's not everywhere, but it's it's whenever there's a discrete category or or a right. sorted list is the is the right which which is many it is recommendation campaign exactly. selection. It's not bidding exactly. Uh, but that's not so so hard, but yeah, okay. Right. Um, so I think uh, we knew we wanted to build this somewhere in two thousand uh, beginning of two thousand eighteen, and we had the first prototype by the end of the year, I think. And 2019, we 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 shipped it, like we, we had it live. Yeah, it was a good year. I think. Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, and then, you know, COVID came. <laughs> and then other stuff was uh, annoying. OK. So I was going to ask you, what, what are you most proud of and what we've done? But maybe maybe it is it is deep down. To um, some level, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm just, yeah. I'm just sorry we didn't go as fast as we could have and i think copy had a bunch to do with it and then yeah i think um we exploited but we we stopped we stopped uh, for a while you know like doing the user model and a bunch of things or putting conversion optimization in this and we went i think too fast in exploitation mode and we kind of use it for new new applications like contextual audiences uh when we could have probably gone geek here but then yeah, like that. That was not my call. I actually think this is like one of the in a tech company. One of the hardest balances is to be a total dreamer, right, or to be a total realist. And I, I, I guess I, I'll maybe between the two of it. I think anyone that's sensible must jump between the two. I, I actually like logistic regression without without shame. But yeah. then I find some people think you you're, you're defending some old. Tech. old thing that we really shouldn't do and it's a i think this the biggest challenge actually is is right is, I, I do agree yeah it, it's tough yeah it's tough it's tough um in general i think it's in tech it's, it's hard to stay relevant and kind of reinventing yourself with every and not becoming the you know the grumpy old dude to say you know like you know you don't get it like you're reinventing the wheel i think that there is yeah, there, there is an opportunity in every new wave of technology. I, I, I wouldn't call myself an early adapter, but I do like to play around with, with whatever is new and see if it fits what we need. Sometimes you are. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get to you, Ellen. Uh, yeah. um, what surprised you most when you learned about recommendation in industry? Well, did you have ideas that were thrown aside? I actually, I'm asking this because I kind of... Because you did. Say, yeah, I, I did. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah, and any preconceived notions per se. Um, I think yeah, I think the you know like the 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 thing that I didn't plan for or basically that basically was a challenge that I didn't expect was the, the metrics challenge, right? I, I didn't expect again coming from a bidding background where uh, likelihood it's such a good offline metric and you you don't know that you have a good metric until you don't have one, you know, like being able to do offline model selection and then going to A-B test and most of the time it kind of works. Uh, that was, that made life so easy in some sense. And then when I moved to Reco and then like I realized that most of our metrics suck or, you know, we have too many metrics because you have these two step and you don't know, you know, you have a source metric and then you have a ranking metric and then you don't know how to, to do offline model selection. To, to know anything about the test, then basically you have to go to the test to find out things and that slows you down. I did do that. That was that was the thing that really, I, yeah, I was not prepared for it, but then that became kind of a thing that I wanted to to try to solve. And that's how, you know, reveal came about, recording came about, then consequences and so on and so forth. I don't think I've ever moved on from this, but... Uh, <laughs> right, exactly. We have it, never solved it. It, 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 it is, it is uh, uh, yeah. P equals NP recommendation, yeah, I think. But, yeah, exactly. but can you maybe d dig into a bit about why, what, what it is you would like a metric to do and what it can, what they really do do, why, the, why they don't perform? Well, I mean, I mean, at least for our case, right? I mean, for, uh, for the case of recommendation, I mean, ideally would want to have an offline metric that, you know, what we call an offline A-B test, uh, you would like a metric that just says, you know, if you run this model in production, you'll make a lot more money, right? You will drive a lot more conversions uh, on on your client website. And, you know, and that that would be a, a huge, uh, a huge win because then you would just have to run many, many tests on, offline 
and then just pick the winner and be sure that it's going to be a positive A-B test. Because, of course, an A-B test, you know, you don't have any other, a lot of A-B test slots. You can run maybe one or two A-B tests in parallel. They need to last for a while. You know, you have the cost of dev. So you can run only that many A-B tests in a year, right? Um, as opposed to models that offline that you could score so many, right? So it would be a huge multiplier. And that that just doesn't happen, right? You you don't know how to compute that kind of metric offline. You don't know how to say, if I run this new decision system and I'm going to show these new types of products which were never in the logs, you don't know what to happen you, unless you have such a good model of conversions that then you basically solve recommendation, right? So it's a chicken and egg problem um, to to find out is my new recommendation policy better than the previous one? And uh, we have a lot of proxies. Some would call them heuristics, uh, <laughs> uh, but in the end, you have to go to the test, and that's 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 where it at. It's at and, yeah, I think something that's confusing about the time offline offline metric. It sounds like that you are measure. It's an attempt to measure the AB test. That, that it's it's maybe well, approximate it, or rough, but it's but it's, it's a technical it's, metric. Yeah, basically, it's, it's, it, in it fact, what's happening is you have your users arriving. They're viewing a bunch of stuff, so you know something about them. You recommend them full banners of K items. Then, then you might do that repeatedly, and then, and then, so, and so forth. There's, so there's, and then on some of them, not very, you know, and, and in, parse, in advertising parse. on just some of them, a very right. small fraction, you you get something. You get something. You get the response that you like. Right. And then the question and, is, what did you do right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and. And maybe nothing. <laughs> what I, if I'm going to start to give my commentary on it, yeah, the, the, uh, it's just a guess. Uh, yeah, the metrics we have is this is, yeah, uh, right. when you say mention the code counts before, and it's the thing I, I was so most surprised about is that you start to, you have this, this thing with things like code counts or things like content, something that is purely a proxy. You start disrespecting, you know, like, well, it's really, really not what we care about. We want to drive business value, et cetera. And then you start to look at what that what? information you get on the business value and that feedback, and you realize it's not that useful, and you turn back to it. Right. And so for me, there was this, uh, let's say, collaborative filtering. The co-counts co is collaborative right. filtering, yeah. roughly. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. roughly. Um, and then you then you move, move away from it and then move back to it. So and that was a block for you, right? Well, yeah, okay. So when, uh, we should actually the first thing you did, and I, in some ways, I think I never moved past it. When you, and I didn't even necessarily like it at the start. There was like, oh, here's the record gym project, which is what tell me, tell everyone what, what is record gym. And, and uh, well, it was my attempt. I, I think uh, open gym just again, open AI gym was studied, and it was about you know benchmarking uh, different uh, RL agents. And I realized that we're you know, we're trying to benchmark policies, and I was. Why don't we create a kind of a sandbox uh, game where we we control everything, we know everything, and we we just try to see offline if a method is better than the other, and we use that some form of a unit test. Like if it's not even good in a very simulated environment in which we know the rules and the rules are quite simple to to get the reward, what's the hope of doing that in real world, right? So that was kind of the philosophy, and uh, behind it, like it was kind of already built in. You know the the nature of the advertising business, so at least the crypto business, where most of the signal is this signal, which is you know what we call the organic signal. It's like what the users do by themselves on the on the, on the client website, right? What, what are their natural displays of interest, right? What what do, would they do if left uh, alone? And then you have the other part of the of the story, which is how do they react to your intervention, right? How do they how much they click on the on the ads that you show, how many conversions happen after they clicked on those ads, right? And then that, of course, is very biased set and very sparse set, right? You only know things, and that's the bandit part. Um, you only know things if you do them, right? That, that it comes from the contextual bandit, right? So you will only collect, and contextual bandit was created for advertising at Yahoo. Um, because, yeah, that's, that's the, the, the nature of the beast. You only know you only get to know the reward if you do an action, right? And you have millions of actions in, in reality in recommender systems, and you only can try hundreds, thousands of them, right? So you have a very small subset of actions that you explore, and you only know information about them, right? And that that forces you to rely on other type of information to be able to estimate anything about all the other actions. 
And that's what we call the organic. Uh, and you can also think about the content uh, signal as being also the way you can hope to start addressing recommendation as a problem. So, and that's how you start talking about relevance. And that's how you start talking about all these other things. I think organically, actually, people started with relevance because at the beginning there was no benefit feedback, right? The first time you create a website and you have a recommendation system, you don't have clicks because you never had recommendations. You cannot have clicks on it. So the V0 of any recommender system will, will definitely be based on some intuitive notions of like, I'm going to show things that are relevant to the user and the user will react to my recommendation proportionally to how useful they are, right? And then you just build up on that. So you'll have some relevance metric that you will drive first. But then as you get clicks and actually maybe get paid for them or so you have some sales, you'll get addicted to that signal. You want, of course, to say, okay, how do I make my recommendation convert more? How do, do I cause more, more sales on my website through my recommender system? So you want to use that signal. It's just that it's sparse and it's small and it's biased, right? So, so you live in this hybrid system where you have a lot of organic activity or some relevant based relevance based signal and then a bit of action based signal and that's exactly what we did in record gym we, we we created a system in which we knew everything about the user we knew what the user does by itself and then how how it reacts to ads and then try to derive from that data better policies some people when they say this they think base is yeah. the only way to do it some people some people <laughs> We wrote a base paper right. on the blog, the blog paper 2020 or so, a long time ago now. And it flies in. many other things since. Exactly. Uh, some people like it. Yeah. Yeah. We never actually did do an RL system based on that, like that went to production, which I'm still waiting. I'm still well, waiting. Okay. So it's not like, you know, I got my wish either. So, <laughs> you know, like uh, in the end, ranking methods were like disclaimer, you know what I mean? Like out of the two, none of them went. Heuristics. Uh, yeah, heuristics everywhere. But, you know, they work. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I think one thing, a big plus of the deep learning stuff is experimentation and trying things. Is, exactly, exactly. It's all about it does include the, crazy things usually, but people can try things. Exactly. Very that, that's, and, yeah. You know, that's one of the bigger things. Yeah. And so we should talk about Rexus and okay. and yeah, fact that we're uh, back. We're back. So Rexus is on Monday. Yeah, it starts on Monday we'll with, the, there. with a bunch of workshops, and uh, we're gonna have one uh, consequences which we've been co-organizing for now three years, and it's I would say the natural uh, the natural uh, continuation of review which we did for five more years. Um, and then yeah, we're gonna have. Uh, well, what is it first? What what is it? Okay. Well, for people that don't know, uh, it's basically it's kind of a whole workshop on record. You know, let's say uh, it's uh, it's about uh, all these problems of offline online uh, alignment and recommendations, and how do you do counterfactual estimation? How do you create better offline metrics to kind of predict online uh, online behavior? How do you create uh, you know RL methods or uh, contextual blended methods? All the things that David likes. Um, I like some of them. Uh, some, some. Uh, sometimes we accept Bayesian papers too. And uh, yeah, it's uh, I would say it's one of the more fun workshops that uh, there, uh, there is. And, the, uh, and how is it different? Uh, it's maybe not a totally easy question, mm -hmm. but how is it different from the main conference? Is, well, it, that, is it different? I think it's uh, getting less different. I think people more and more are coming back to, to the bed, like to the bed signal. I think a lot of the classical literature is about, you know, like uh, movie lens and kind of rating matrices and kind of regressing some data sets because, you know, that, that's what you have, right? That's, that's the only thing you can have offline. You cannot, unless you have a simulator, you cannot answer the question, what will happen if I change my recommendation to this set? Because that's no, there is no support in the data set. There are a couple of contractual data sets out there. We released one. I think now there are more. There are probably three more. Um, but and, and but then again, your data set is still somehow inherently limited. Right, right of course, because you can always be out of yeah. support. Any unless data you do set. Full any data set. Unless you do full be. exploration and you have very small action space or something. Uh, which I think you want to collect at some point in time, some data like that. Okay. But yeah, so that's that's I would think that the main difference. But then again, I think we were the cool kids, well, I don't know, seven years ago. Now I think it's becoming more mainstream because everybody's realizing. So I think, yeah, it, we are not as different from the main conference that we used to be, which is a good thing. I mean, that that's all the whole point. Like the deep learning workshop stopped existing because the whole conference is now deep learning. So 
Um, so at some point, then maybe we'll also stop existing because we we did the job. Like everybody believes that that uh, that's a real problem because that's all we're trying to. Do. I don't think we have a solution. We're just saying, yeah, take a look at here and take a look here and let's let's research things. And I mean, that's what we're doing. The Rex is the main Rex is failure. I think it's in it's a kind of surprising mix of stuff, including machine learning and non-machine learning, industry, academia, right. It's, social it's, science even is sometimes in there. It's a real, really quite broad field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, fun to see, uh, to see very different points of view. I mean, there is a social impact of a recommendation. There are a lot of people coming from different, I mean, recommender systems come, you know, in all shapes and forms. We're coming with the advertising slant and the, let's say the economic slant, like the, like the making money and the performance driven recommendation in a lot of other places, I think, you know, they don't even measure things in some sense. Um, and it's all vibe based. Um, but I think yeah, the, the, the measurement and the optimization point of view is, you know, gaining foothold and I think it's becoming more and more. I think in the advertising business, it's central. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And since these are the, the, the core recommender systems, I mean, and the metrics driven ones are the core, I mean, the feed ranking for Meta or for Instagram are probably you know one of the biggest YouTube seem right. they YouTube would be all driven. It has a not advertising and non advertising component. Right, but they will still be driving, you know, Engagement. time spent and stuff yeah, like that, right? And TikTok and all of that, right? So so in the end they are still trying to do bandit feedback, right? So very similar problems. Yeah, I think we actually think we have an advantage, but as you went back to it, like we we have much more clear financial value as, as, as right it's not the publisher a the, or something it, or right there you have a lot of like what is the right objective you know you get a bit more exactly uh do you want to plug what's exciting at consequences what oh, you're looking forward to especially oh, the invited talks i think they'll be cool let me i'm gonna look okay, on okay. The... And i'm throwing you some pronunciation I, so uh, that... yeah, exactly i i need to yeah my memory is not what used to be just because i'm very young uh, so yeah, what do we have? We have two keynotes, one by uh, Kian Gillian Lee on counterfactual reasoning and what, what is good for. So very much causality and counterfactual reasoning. Then Torsten Joachims is going to talk about towards steerable AI systems. Um, he always gives very great talks, so it's going to be great. Yuta, who's a co-organizer, will, uh, will give a tutorial and he's always a great speaker. And we have our own paper, you know, like you are, uh, I think, uh, I'm not, you're not, I'm not an author, I, uh, but uh, what man uh, and the yeah. uh, mother and they're both. My those. students don't even need me. Exactly. <laughs> you are that good. <laughs> exactly. This is why I'm not up on management. I, I forget to say this, that, that yes, I didn't do anything, but I hired them. Exactly. <laughs> That's all in it. That's anyway. In it. Exactly. Um, and then outside of that, we, we do have a bunch of things. I'm going to plug you, right? You're going to have a talk on, uh, on, the on why we're shooting in a dark, yeah. right? We're talking about basically heuristics. And, it, right? and actually, I'll do a full version of this on the webinar series. It'll be nine minutes, compressed into nine minutes oh, right. uh, and on the day. But, and then, uh, and then, yeah, we have two more. So, but, yeah. yeah, You're only plugging us, but that's okay. Yeah. We can plug some other people like Michael Jordan and I mean, Well, I think, does he need a plug? <laughs> and uh, I'm just going to say that we have two more uh, workshop papers uh, one on um, Welfare optimizer counter systems, uh, and then one on uh, why am I reading? Because these are my papers, um, but you know uh, they're long names. And one on conversational recommendation, uh, which is uh, you know my work on LMs uh, for Echo. Okay, so, which so brings I, us to what? Tell me about LMs for reasoning. Uh, what, LMs reason? Is no, that well? First, no. I mean, uh, take me slow. No, no, <laughs> like, not you know. Like, uh, are we in Russia? Yes, maybe we are in Russia. So yeah, I, I do like LMs, uh, like some other people here. Oh, that's that's a totally that's, not true. Exactly, you love them, right? So no, I do. I do think that there is there is a um, there is a space for them in in recommendation. Uh, I am a believer. Let's say uh, there is already the trillion pay, parameter paper from Meta, which will be presented at Rexis. So look, I'm, I'm plugging Meta. Uh, apparently, it's in production, and they they use kind of an LLM, and they they saw good results. So I do believe that part. So I do believe that probably. Even over parameterizing even more the the models, maybe we can see something, but that's not what I'm excited about for uh, for LMs. I think I I, I drank the Kool Aid and uh, I do believe in the you know agentic LMs and all that. I think that that's gonna happen. I'm not sure if it's gonna happen like right, you know, right across the corner like it's gonna be next year, but I I do believe in the value that this could bring and I think it's feasible, and I see. 
I see for that the, the main the main blocker being reasoning, right? I mean, I feel that the reason and also both the reason for which some people believe that there is a bubble and basically you know you know the hype it's it's bigger than the their value and the people that are investing in them are are right right like uh, it's they're not totally there but they could be right and i think that's what drives the gpu prices you know open AI valuation and all that and i think once you solve reasoning i think a new class of application will become uh, available because it's a question of trust right like right now you you look at the the, the results of the LLM and you have to check right you, you do not know if it's correct or not right so therefore you cannot put them in mission critical system right you you'll have to put them in you know things that are kind of optional right i mean i think that i don't know if everybody believes that but i, I believe that probably the biggest application right now is probably code generation or assisted code generation right and i think that that's already driving a lot of value but that's just a very particular application and probably the next ones are be i don't know education personalized education like translation probably as well right but I think that we already had, like for me, like the new thing that, right. so for me, like personalized education, I can already start seeing some value there and probably entertainment. I mean, definitely entertainment. Like I can see a lot of things that could come or, I don't know, like, or video game generation and stuff like that. I think together with the image generation part and asset generation part, I think uh, video games will be a big uh, consumer of everything that comes from Gen AI. But this is still not the core value, I think, that happens. I think the agent part that, you know, Meta is going for, uh, I think OpenAI is going to everybody is going for. If done right, it could be huge, right? Um, and that's that's how it connects to recommendation, right? Because this agent and future record, what are they? They're pretty much the same thing, right? They're trying to solve user needs and it's to no, kind of it's no longer longer return your list it's something right it's gonna be well the, you already can slap a conversation layer on top of our recommender system and you could probably get something out of it and I, we are experimenting with that and i think that's already something but the point is right now i mean the, the level of reasoning that you expect from an llm is that if you say that you're traveling to rome it will use common sense reasoning and kind of start recommending you hotels in rome which is like not wow, right? But if you want, for example, right now to say to an LLM, you know, recommend me a whole itinerary in Italy for a multi-generational family under this budget, it will totally fail. And you don't even like, like nobody's even gonna try. It's not crazy enough to try it. Well, I was crazy enough to try it just to know how it will fail, but nobody even evaluates an LLM to, to like a multi-stakeholder, so many constraints like, you know it will fail. You don't know how. You don't have the patience to to know, but it will fail, right? So the this we're we're sure it's not good for, right? But imagine a world in which actually the reasoning steps are guaranteed. I mean, that that can be done, right? And then why not? And then that unlocks a huge amount of value, right? You can offload now a bunch of tasks, and this is just you know this is on the B two C on B two B, all the R and D that can be done, you know, assisted by it, like you know in biotech, in material science, in chip design, with this kind of models will be amazing, right? And the fact that you will trust the results, like you'll have at the end, like some form of consistency proof, like that, that, that'll be huge. Of course, you might believe that that's, it cannot be done. Well, but I've I been think, wrong enough times to uh, But I think it can be done. Uh, well, I think it can be done at least at human level. And then if it's done at human level, of course, then there is the question of like displacing the workforce and stuff like that. But I think that, that so the singularity is is soon. I wouldn't. I don't know if it's it's going to be a rogue AI taking over the world or anything like that. But I think I'm more into the positive scale, or like not positive. But I mean, maybe people are that, 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 that it, it like it's going to be smarter than us. Well, next uh, week, you know, and, our and... Uh, latest uh, you know physics uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, you know, he's very afraid of that, and he he said that he's very happy he got the words that he can say even louder, you know, like, don't do it. Though he actively participated in creating this, so I see a little inconsistency there, like, uh, what was he thinking? Uh, but, you know, maybe he regrets the whole thing. Uh, personally, I don't. Like, I, I think it's going to... I mean, I'm, I'm afraid, of course, but uh, different, like, less, you know, sci-fi scenarios, just concentration of power, other, you know, more regular disruptions. I, I don't believe that... The crazy, I mean, just from very simple lines of thought, it is 
reading everything in the world will teach you some things, but not everything. Like the, the, the right, limits, that's, the limits of, of, that's, from that type of direction. That's the essence. Causality stuff still hard. Will be it will be as bad as causality. Well, that this agent will have to run experiments in the world, and so then it will be bound by experiments in the world to discover the nature of reality. Right. So that will be like that will be the limiting factor for knowing new things. Like it will know what we know and deduce some stuff. But then there'll be open questions about like, is this true or not? And then it will have to prove and disprove and run experiments, right? Like a scientist, right? And that will be the limiting like learning speed. So it will slowly take over the world, but slowly. I don't know, even a very simple thing of can you can you read papers and work out which ones have gathered high quality data and which ones have not? I think that's a pretty the psychology. Advantage. Well, that's theoretically, yeah. uh, you know, you can do that by reading a, a smart. Scientists can read right between the lines. A good study it can tell the difference between a good and a bad study. But I see that that with reasoning will be solved, like uh, consistency checks and like I, I, that that part. I'm like I think that I think it's possible. I don't know. I'm, I I can see that's possible, but it, it's not that easy for a human. Right. So I mean, the interpolation of true facts from existing data. I think that that that, that will be accessible to 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 whatever this is. At some level, it returns stuff that's written down. It doesn't return stuff that's true. Right, and that's the, the the that's the consistency issue, right? That's the thing. Like, uh, and these are the the studies that people are doing right now. That it's still not good at OD. Basically, it's not very good at, uh, and it's not like sample efficient, right? You need to show it the true thing many times. That's why a lot of people now are doing a lot of artificial data set generation to to teach it, like you know, mathematical reasoning and stuff like that. So we're very far from an efficient or an efficiently trained deep model or language model, but maybe we don't need to be that efficient. I mean, we got here by, you know, just brute forcing. Probably will brute force for a while until we find something smart. Um, but I do think we will see, you know, like, and that's why I want to work on it. Like, we will see advantage, uh, advances in, in reasoning in the, in the following years. And yeah, like things as simple as like what I would call like a strict mode for, uh, for semantic reasoning, uh, I think would go, like one of the things that I observed is that, and that's one of the papers I have at Rexis, is that it's very hard to 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 tell an LN to be strict in its reasoning to you know to to stick to a meaning to a, for a certain word, and it will slowly through its own reasoning process, kind of have a concept drift and then kind of soft match a concept that at the beginning was supposed to be just you know containing this meaning and then slowly to kind of broaden and kind of adopt other meanings like for example. Uh, you know, uh, I, I created a, a very artificial data set in which I said, we have a user persona that you, um, hates resorts, hates resorts, right? And then I asked the agents to kind of reason about a bunch of products, a bunch of travel packages. And one of them was, uh, you know, was described that the, the, the place, like the hotel was a five-star hotel. Five-star hotels and resorts, most of the time are the same, but they're not always the same. The lender decided that okay, this 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 uh, this product is not acceptable because it's a five star hotel. So it made that decision directly, implicitly. It didn't even ask, you know, like, what do you mean? I'm not sure. It just did it, and you know, imagine that a thousand times. So slowly through the reasoning process, you'll have this, and and humans do it too. Then right, it's very natural. But when we need to be consistent, or we force ourselves to be consistent, we can right, and uh, we stick to a meaning for a bit. And that's why we created, I think, mathematics and formal languages exactly to, to be even more consistent and kind of be very anal about the meaning of things. But when LLMs being trained on human language try to do that on like a natural language, they, they just diverge. And I think being able to have a strict reasoning mode or a strict semantic mode for you know natural language reasoning, that would be itself like a, and that's one of the things I'm, I'm gonna try to pursue. That that could be itself something very interesting, I would say. And then there are many other tricks, I would say, for for uh, for for consistent reasoning that uh, I think will, will help a lot. So that's kind of my uh, latest and greatest. And I think for I mean, just to finish with my my shopping list for LLMs and the record, the other thing that I'm not sure that, that LLMs can do, and I'm not sure how to do it, is user preference elicitation in context. Like if you assume that you will have a recommender system that you talk to, you would hope that from the preferences that you declare, like, you know, 
from A and B, I choose B, from C and D, I choose D, you would hope that it will be as good as a, let's say, a linear classifier and finding out kind of estimate what are the properties that made you choose those things, right? And to kind of create internally a representation of what you like and how much you like it and be consistent with that representation. And I'm, um, I haven't run the experiments. I want to do that. I'm pretty sure that it won't be able to do it correctly and it will be worse than like a, like an SEM, right? And the question is, if you really want this to replace the SEM, it better be better, right? So how do you do that without actually calling the SEM in the background, right? Can you do that directly in context in the LLM? And that's, I think, uh, something quite interesting. But because otherwise, there is no, no reason to to switch to conversational agents if they're not better at understanding the user utility than, uh, you know, linear mode. Uh, but I'm, I'm confident that this can be done. And once that is done, then they will become more useful. That, that's going to be, for me, the next generation of recall models, agents, whatever. So, yeah. Exciting stuff. Yeah, I'm, I am. I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll keep you busy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, there's no questions. If anyone wants to throw out a question for Flavian, but otherwise, I guess we can almost wrap up. Right um, sure. Record bars, you know. It's always good to, to finish with a beer. Yeah, but thanks. we'll maybe see some of you in, in Barry. That'll yeah, be really exactly. fun. I we'll find it Sunday and then Monday we'll all be at the workshops. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, well, thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.